Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a video and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Today, it is my privilege to welcome a very accomplished entrepreneur from the United Arab Emirates, Muna Isa Al Gurg. Muna, welcome to the show. Thank you, Ashutosh, for having me. Thank you. Muna is uh, the director of retail of the Isa Sala Al Gurg group. She sits on several boards. She's recognized globally for her work. She's from London Business School. She's a member of the Aspen Global Leadership Network. And she's a columnist for the Gulf News. So, Muna, tell me a little bit about your early life and maybe three milestones. Mm-hmm. So I joined the family business, the Alger Group, in the year 2000, and I was really a fresh graduate. Uh, my background was marketing and advertising, mm-hmm. and I was very fortunate uh, because at the time we were going through this transitional stage right. where the group was going from being a traditional sort of trading company and conglomerate to being this uh, organization that's thinking about its brand ethos and about, you know, uh, its communication, et cetera, et cetera. So, right. And so I'm second generation family mm-hmm. business. And one of the, you know, challenges I would say that every next gen kind of has in mind is how do you add value to this organization? So not just, obviously, you're going to learn a lot because this is a, an experienced organization, well-established, but then how do you add value? What is your role? Right. And so I think at the time I was, again, as I said, quite fortunate to be part of this department that had just been set up, marketing department. I got to learn from, at the time, a mentor who was over 20 years experience. And so it was exciting times, to be honest with you, diving deep into our brands, really learning more about the ethos of the brands. Mm -hmm. I would say the three key milestones for me is firstly starting off with what's my role in this family business, establishing that, learning more about how I can add value to the organization and finding my place because that's really where, you know, family members are distinguished from non-family members, you know, and so, as you know, non-family members being obviously employees. So, that was the first thing that I needed to establish and it was a first key milestone and I think that if I was not part of that change within the organization I might have been a bit lost Mm -hmm. but I think that because I was part of that change that really was within my niche of work Mm -hmm. it it was I I, you know very easily sort of uh, slipped into the uh, role and I I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. The second milestone would be after eight years of working uh, within the group and fully immersing myself and engrossing myself within marketing and communications, I felt that, you know, there needed to be, I needed to learn more holistically about this group and about the business. And obviously, being the next gen, it was my business too. Mm-hmm. So it was really important for me to learn more uh, within, uh, you know, the finance and accounting. So my second milestone was, how do I do this? And that's where I explored and I uh, started my MBA with London Business School, which really exposed me to everyone from a small business owner, right up to somebody who heads British Telecom to, you know, so, you know, Brazilian oil uh, company, uh, you know, employees. So it was really, really interesting. And it, obviously, I learned a lot from the MBA. My third milestone would be post MBA in 2008, when I graduated, the world was going through a recession. And obviously, the UAE was also going through a recession. And, you know, I was uh, told to, you know, my sister, who's the managing director of the group, uh, pulled me aside and said, you know what, we are as a retail part of the group going through challenges. It's a very difficult time. Now that you've done your MBA, we want you to head the retail side. <laughs> no pressures. <laughs> and so, uh, so that really was my third milestone in my career. And, you know, you run a very large portfolio of the group, which is retail. Tell me about the scope of your retail businesses. So our retail, uh, the retail is mainly uh, home lifestyle. 
So a little bit about the group and then I'll tell you about the retail. Our group is, uh, we are celebrating 60 years this year and we, you know, we have 27 companies manufacturing industrial also and uh, we have 370 brands that we represent, some of which you probably have heard of, like Siemens, Unilever, Dunlop, etc. And so uh, we've been part of great projects in the UAE. It's fantastic to be impacting, you know, uh, the Dubai Opera or the Louvre and the Abu Dhabi or the Sheikh Zayed Mosque, you know, with lighting. So it's been such a great journey so far with the group and, you know, impacting the UAE from all perspectives. From a retail perspective, it's 20% of the group. And I would say that, as I said, we fall into uh, home home lifestyle. So furniture, so you're looking at uh, luxury furniture, affordable furniture, home appliances. We have a chain of stores called Better Life where we, we sell home appliances, kitchens, luxury ca- cabinets, etc. So that's basically what the retail does. And that's what I had for everything from communications right down to, you know, the customer experience and how the employees, you know, interact with our retail. You know, in today's environment, when people are not coming into malls, etc. Hmm. How is e-commerce changing your business? So, you know, if you're looking at e-commerce and the way also it changes the malls, you know, several thoughts there, several schools of thought here. And some people believe e-commerce is hurting malls and the business. Others believe it's complementing malls. It depends on your segment and your brands and several other variables. But buying furniture online is still hard to do with conviction. So customers want that offline interaction with many types of product before purchasing. So what we've noticed as a group is that customers do a lot of research online, but really they want that touch and feel, particularly pre-COVID. And so they would make the purchase offline in most cases, particularly in furniture and home appliances. There is no doubt that e-commerce has meant price discovery has become massively more efficient. So you cannot overcharge consumers because everyone has a smartphone and access to global prices at the touch of a button. And obviously we know from um, the latest stats that I can share from within the UAE, 80% of consumers in the UAE have shifted part of their purchasing online post pandemic and 50% have said that they will continue to do so you know again post post pandemic so so basically it's 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 really important to get your communications right and it you have to take your consumer through that seamless journey you know so so yeah and and uh, does your group also own the malls the real estate or no 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 we're just retailers that rent within the malls yeah okay. Very interesting so you know, UAE and South Asia have both built, Southeast Asia, not South Asia, have both built huge uh, economies based on retail. Mm. Is this going to change given the fact that a lot of the other economies have started to open up? I mean, I hope so, because I mean, I hope we change from that perspective. We ultimately need to anchor our economies in high value professional services and intellectual property, because I I, I truly believe that this is the future for this country, at least. These are the types of roles that in turn create job opportunities for others. Uh, I mean, I think one silver lining is that because we're not big in manufacturing in the UAE, we face less of a threat from increasing automation. But I, I, I feel that we definitely need to also start exploring other you know, sectors. Uh, And we need to look beyond real estate. Real estate has worked, definitely worked for this period of time. But going forward, IP is important. Investing in IP is important, etc. So very interesting. And my next question to you relating to retail is that this is the generation of the millennials and the Gen Z's. Yeah. What is your opinion of how this category of people and you, you're not too far away from the millennials yourself but uh, how how are, how are this younger group of people changing mm-hmm. retail yeah this is a very interesting question ashutosh um, and uh, thanks for asking it i think uh, generation z and uh, millennials are uh, c- uh, conscious consumers mm-hmm. 
Okay. And what does that mean? Uh, they do a lot of research into the product that they buy. They want to know whether there's a socially impactful product that they're buying or business that they're investing into. Uh, you know, what is the sustainability? Where did this, did this wooden toy come from a sustainable forest? Uh, you know, is it looking into the environment? Are they ethical with their employees? So this is the way the new generation are thinking of buying products. It's not enough just thinking about, you know, it's a, just a global product and, and, and it's got this big brand anymore. People do a lot more research into what they're buying. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's important to, to cater to that from a perspective of giving these millennials and Generation Z a story behind what you're selling. It's not enough to just say, I've got a great product and here's the big brand. You've got to tell them about how you talk to your employees. How do you, de you know, how do you, what, who are your suppliers? What's your supply chain? You know, what's the story? Is it handmade? Is it this or is it that? And so that is very important when you're communicating to the next generation. Fascinating. So let's move to the next segment of our conversation, which is all the NGOs. I mean, you know, I was fascinated when I was reading about you. You know, one is to sit on the board of several NGOs. You're the chairwoman of the Arab Leaders. You're, you're board member of Endeavor UAE. You have, uh, you know, you're part of the Emirates Foundation for Youth Development. At London Business School, you have your own scholarship named after yourself. My question to you is that what drives you to give so much back to so many organizations? To be honest with you, Ashutosh, I think I, uh, I've had it in my DNA because I've been so, in, you know, seen it with my father. He did, he, he was part of this capitalistic world, but he also always gave back. And so I think that that was something that I subliminally always absorbed. And I just feel now as an adult that this is a, a responsibility. When you have wealth, it's a responsibility. You know, it, obviously we all want to make a profit and we all want to enjoy that. But at the end of the day, what about your community? What are you impacting in this world? What are you leaving behind? You have so much power when you you have that ability to do so. So what are you doing with that? And so I think to me, I just see it purely as a responsibility. And I, I definitely like make the time for it because I feel that I want to do it. Mm -hmm. I want to impact my community and the greater world. So you want to talk a little bit about each of these a little? So, you know, what, the, what, what does the, the young Arab leaders do? What is Endeavor UAE? Yeah. So predominantly, uh, all these organizations that I work in are impacting youth uh, and, and young entrepreneurs. So when it comes to uh, young Arab leaders, we are honing and developing the next generation of Arab young Arab leaders. Uh, and this is through the role models that we have through the network, a little bit like YPO, where there's a good network of, you know, uh, people who have been very successful within their field and they kind of are mentors towards these um, young young entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. The same with Endeavor. It's social impact. It's driven by a high impact and, and getting those uh, businesses to go to the next level. How do you take uh, you know, a $1 million business to a $10 million business? We help them through this mentorship network through Endeavor, which is this fantastic, you know, incredible global network and also now regional. And Emirates Foundation, again, I work with uh, His Highness Sheikh Abdullah bin Zayed, who is our foreign minister. He's the chairman of Emirates Foundation. It's a, it's a federal foundation for youth. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this is exactly what I've been doing over the last, I would say, 10 years. Mm -hmm. And it's really made me think about, you know, the future and what I'd like to do from a philanthropy perspective. Uh, and that's why last year I worked with the Gates Foundation for six months mm -hmm. to work on what is my passion and what is my legacy and what I'd like to leave behind from a philanthropic perspective. And what is it? <laughs> so... I finally come to a conclusion after, uh, you know, a couple of years of really diving into this is I'm very passionate about impacting women and girls in the Middle East and Northern Africa. Mm -hmm. And so we all know that 
there are some very crucial problems that are happening within the Arab world. And obviously, women don't have it e easy either. You know, women are usually the second option. If you have a girl and a boy, it's it's the girl. And so and so basically, I feel that there's so much opportunity out there that we can work with, you know, grassroots nonprofits. Um, and, and so now I'm doing a lot of research into these countries to see what uh, what how we can work with these grassroots uh, NGOs. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing a lot of work with them to see what are the gaps, where can we fill in those gaps. And really, in my 50s and 60s, I'd honestly, I'd like to spend a lot more time on ground impacting women and girls in the MENA region and all. Yeah. And, you know, you spoke about all the work that you're doing with all these uh, NGOs. Mm -hmm. There is, and in the corporate sector, in our part of the world, if I can use that, Middle East, South Asia, Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. the talk of gender balance has just about started to get relevant. Right. You know, Europe, uh, the US has been talking about it and doing a lot. Correct. What, in your opinion, can be done hmm. in the Middle East and Asia to increase or support gender balance? Yeah. So this is a good question, and I'm glad I'm able to speak on this topic. We all know that there's like compelling evidence that there needs to be significantly more investments into inclusive leadership. What does that mean? Gender balance on boards and senior management not only encourages better leadership and governance, but diversity and inclusion further contributes to an all-round board performance and obviously increased shareholder value. So uh, to be honest with you, I have really looked into this recently and, and I feel that again, it's the responsibility lies on organizations to take this forward. So for example, what are you doing? What am I doing? You know, it's very easy to uh, have panel discussions where women talk about gender balance and you know, how do we bridge that gap? But what are we actually doing? What are we actually doing? So again, we recently, as the Algur Group, uh, partnered with the 30% Club. And the 30% Club is a global organization that mm -hmm. advocates that your organization should work towards having at least 30% of the workforce force to be female. And what does the 30% Club do? They give you the tools to look at everything from recruitment, career development, training, marketing, how do you market yourself on your website towards women and, and you know, everything. And it's a fantastic toolkit. I cannot recommend it more than this. I mean, I honestly feel every organization should look into the 30% club. And it's not easy. It's not easy, to be honest with you, because I've now been doing it with my HR and my communications team. It is not easy. And that is why a lot of organizations put it on the shelf. They talk about it, but they don't do much about it. Mm -hmm. But it requires this top down kind of, you know, approach and strategy, which I'm doing within our group. And I feel that there are several ways that you can. You can look at your country and you can look at where the gap is. Obviously, governments can do their bit from a government perspective position, which we're doing a fantastic job here. 50% of our federal national council are women now. And so the government is doing a fantastic job. I always say it's actually the private sector that is lagging in, the, in, in, in our part of the world. Mm -hmm. Private sector are very pleased with, you know, doing well and they, you know, they, they don't look into things. So I think it's important to talk a lot more, but also dive deeper into your own organization, because it's always when you dive into your own that you take yourself out of your comfort zone. Well said, well said. Yeah. So I've got now time for a few questions for you personally. Okay. My <laughs> first question is, uh, you know, after such an amazing run, so much recognition, achievement, what does success mean to Muna? I think that success is really adding value to your shareholders, to your employees, and to ultimately your customers. So if you can improve your employees' lives, Mm -hmm. If you can improve your customer's journey and everything, I think that that really is success from a business perspective. Okay. My next question is that where do you draw your inspiration from for, for doing so many diverse things? 
as I mentioned before, my father has been a fantastic example and role model. He started his life in, a, you know, he was working in a post office. And so, he, you know, he re it really is, you know, the story of, you know, real hard, sheer hard work. He has an autobiography called uh, The Wells of Memory. So if anyone would like to read it, it's really tells you the journey of, of Dubai, you know, and, and how it was built from old Dubai to new Dubai. So fantastic journey there that really I have learned a lot from, from that perspective. And I drive, I get a lot of inspiration from there. Also, I live in a very dynamic city, to be honest with you. So uh, on a daily basis, we are reminded of how Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid, the leader of Dubai, is such a, you know, forward thinking person, always thinking about the future, always thinking about, you know, how you can improve, being there, talking to his people, being present. You know, not just somebody that you read about, but actually somebody who you get to interact with sometimes. So this this really has been also my inspiration. You drive on the roads of Dubai and you get inspired, you know. So Yeah, I've seen it I've seen Dubai change over the last 30 years, and every time I visit, yeah. I see something new. So it's amazing. Yeah. So my next question to you is that how do you set personal and professional goals? Yeah. So this is this is this is also a very good question because a few years ago I decided to uh, take on a coaching session which helped me tremendously. I couldn't believe that I had not done this before, <laughs> and so uh, I sat down with a coach, and this coach really put both goals down, help me put it down on paper. So you obviously as an individual have many things in your mind and it's like your mind is all over the place. You know what you want to achieve, but it's not structured on paper for you. And so that coach really helped me do that. And I remember I went back to him a year and a half later and I had ticked all the, all the lines of what we had achieved. And he said, oh my God, I wish every single person was like you comes back with all, everything you know, ticked off. So, but I felt it was very, very useful. So I think it's, you know, if, uh, one can invest a little bit of money and time into a coach, super helpful. Fantastic. Okay. My next question is that if you, Muna, were a role model to millions of children who closely followed you and your life choices, what is the one thing you would change in yourself? So this question is a very tough question. Uh, <laughs> and you need to do some soul searching on this one. Yeah, it took me a couple of days to sit and really think about what it is. And I would say really, um, I have become more assertive over the last 10 years, but I really wish that I was more assertive from a younger age. And I see this trait a lot in in millennials and Gen Z, much more assertive, know what they want, sometimes a little bit too much, but you know, it, it's, it's great because it shows confidence, you know? And so I wish that I was that way 20 years ago, let's say, Terrific. being more assertive. Terrific. And my last question to you, I come, I come back to the pandemic, which has affected each one of us all over the world. How are you rethinking your life in a yeah. new world order? Yeah. So the pandemic has made me really reflect on my health and my body. And I used to exercise and do a bit of boxing before the pandemic. And I felt that that was enough. Mm -hmm. And I revolved my uh, day around work rather than exercise. And over the last seven months, I took on exercise so seriously. And I took on, you know, thinking about my health and exactly what I eat and researching foods and reading books on what's good for the gut, you know, and I've turned into this person who's very, very invested in, in my health and my body. And so now I exercise about six times in the week. Uh, there are absolutely no excuses. I've lost some weight. I feel healthy. I feel really good. So from, from a personal perspective, that's, that's the change. I would also say from a goals perspective, I've thought more, a lot more about, you know, the, the good work that I'd like to leave in the world. You know, what is the impact that I'd like to leave in the world, even beyond what you see I'm doing, I'm talking more 
regionally, you know, looking beyond the UAE, looking as a region, as a MENA region, what am I doing? And so uh, over again, the last six months, I've been researching countries like Lebanon, Egypt, etc., looking at the gaps there, seeing what I can do in the future to formulate, you know, good impactful projects and initiatives uh, and that's really what this this has uh, led me to, the pandemic has led Fantastic. Me to. Una, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure and privilege speaking to you. Thank I you. wish you lots of success in everything that you're doing. Thank you, Ashutosh. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Brand Called You videocast and podcast platform that brings you knowledge, experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called you.